Welcome to the Hands On Business Podcast. Thanks for taking time out to listen to us and thanks very much for all the feedback that has been flowing in. Now, I've noticed there's been a little bit of an increase in feedback ever since I said that there will be a prize draw for one of these bad boys for people who feedback in the Rate This Podcast link. Who knew that they would be so popular? So keep that feedback flowing. Anyway, on to today and my guest, Jill McKay, who for more than 20 years has worked with coaches, trainers, HR and business professionals to amplify their results using neuroscience in their work. So we're going to be getting into the science today. So I'm hoping you're going to stay with us because it's going to be very, very interesting. Now, Jill's teaching helps those clients to increase uh, self-awareness, their emotional engagement and awaken their brains to help them achieve deep transformation and change, which I think most people in business are trying to achieve. So that's a really important aspect. Now, as co-founder of My Brain International and the neurometric profiling instrument Mind, she provides international coach federation accredited tools and resources for the appliance of neuroscience. So Jill is passionate about helping people to understand their brain and what makes them unique by giving them a language for strength and preferences. And she says she's on a mission to enable people to make friends with their brain so they can create their best life and truly embrace their uniqueness. So you might have seen a bit of a a link there because we've been doing a lot about how to empower oneself and bring out their uniqueness over the last few podcasts. Now, importantly, Jill is also author of the best-selling book, Stuck, Brain Smart Insights for Coaches, which shares her coaching stories and how clients can ch- create change by understanding the neuroscience behind their challenges. Hope that I've done you justice there. Welcome, Jill. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for welcoming me and absolutely you've done me justice. I don't really know what to add to that now. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry. Don't worry. I've got plenty of questions for you, Jill, and we'll get into those and not too distant. So today what we're going to be discussing with Jill's uh, background is we're going to be asking why neuroscience matters in business, because we want to get into how we can use neurosciences for greater success. So obviously, well, obvious to me anyway. The first question <laughs> to get people on the same page, what, what is neuroscience? How would you define it, Jill? Well, in the formal sense, neuroscience is the study of the brain and the central nervous system. So that's the actual pure answer to the question. So the, the people who are qualified in neuroscience who work in the sort of clinical and medical field, they look at the brain, at all its functions, its workings, how it keeps the body going and, and, and the nervous system going. What is absolutely fantastic now is that we're able to take the findings of all of that work, that research, not just and not just use it in that clinical and medical sense but bring it into the world of business and the reason we're able to do that is because of advances in scanning technologies so that no longer do we just rely on the results of findings from and by the way these findings are wonderful and still very relevant but findings from working with say patients who've got extreme neuro conditions like schizophrenia or from cutting up brains in labs you know, again it's still really useful to do the autopsies and study the brain or from performing rodent rats or animal-based experiment scanning has allowed us to take a look inside the brains of healthy fully functioning human beings so that we can actually look at the results of those in normal day-to-day settings and see what's happening inside our heads. So at its simplest, circling around to your question, neuroscience is a study of the brain. It's been around for a long while, as has much of medical science, but neuroscientists are increasingly now looking at the study of the brain and behaviour, the study of human behaviour. So I like to kind of say that we're we're in the stage now, the, the time now where we're shaking hands with the psychologists. So we can actually look at a physical level what's happening in the human mind when we're making a decision when we're reaching a conclusion when we're taking an action when we're doing something and interesting enough because when we were offline you said that all coaches because you just mentioned human behavior Mm -hmm. there and you basically said all coaches are are, are effectively in human into human behavior or neuroscience and if they're not they should be (laughs) so 
<laughs> which which is very true. So so it's obviously mindset and and, yeah. and attitude is becoming really really popular, yeah. which then links into neuroscience. Yeah. So what do you think it adds to business? I think it adds a, a, a lot to business. I think it adds so what it doesn't do, and I'll say this right now, Hakeem, is it does not replace anything. So if you're a trained coach, if you're a trained mentor or facilitator, anything in the development area, if you're a trained marketeer, it doesn't replace any of the great tools and resources that you use to engage with other people, build relations with relationships and, and be successful in your life. What it adds is a layer of understanding around behavior. It, adds for yourself it adds a layer of self-awareness um, it adds that layer of understanding your own identity what makes you tick at a physical level so I kind of um, just, just give me a second to use a metaphor I like, I like metaphors I kind of um, can look at the brain as so though by using the metaphor of a house so as coaches and I'll just take that because that's my, my world um, we might be working with our clients to help them rearrange the metaphorical rooms in their lives. So we might, if they want to change a behavior, they want to change something in their, in their lives, then we might say, well, why don't we rearrange the pictures on the walls or change the furniture around or move into a different room metaphorically? But the house also has foundations. So what brain-based coaching does is it helps us understand why moving that picture around or moving to a different room or changing the colour of the paint in the room, why that would make a difference in somebody else's life. So I think um, often that neuroscience helps to engage people at a different level because they're kind of understanding okay this is why I'm sensing this it's not I'm not crazy I'm not odd it's it's an, a normal reaction a normal response to what's going on in the world and it almost frees people up and liberates the, them to to understand that they're not at fault they're not to blame gives them permission to open up and engage with any coaching intervention for instance Okay, thank you. And so, and, and, and what, would you say, because you just described it as brain-based coaching, mm. uh, and obviously not everybody has the neuroscience background, etc. So what would you say is the difference between brain-based or neuroscience-based coaching and, and what, we, what we'd see from a standard coach, if I can put it like that? Oh, wow. I, I mean, I, I think... I would actually use neuro and brain based coaching in, in the same way to be, yeah. to be candid with you, I, the, the, that sort of the application of, of both. So sometimes I think the word neuro or even the word neuroscience is scary for people. Um, genuinely, I think they kind of look at it and think, oh, my goodness, that that's the domain of those incredible clever, clever scientists, which, by the way, it is, you know, it is an incredibly it's an incredible science. You know, all of the people who work in the neuroscience field and brain surgeons, neurosurgeons, etc. It is phenomenal work that they do. What I want to be able to do myself and my business partner, what we we like to do is bridge the gap between that weighty academia that's we need it to be research based and empirical and you know all the all the rest of it we want to bridge the gap between that academia and what i call the neuro nonsense and um so there's a lot of neuro nonsense you know the neuro the popularity uh, fake news out there that take this magic pill and you'll never get alzheimer's or you know or this confidence pill or drink this drink and and you know you will make five sales calls every day with pure confidence you know there, there is i'm being a bit extreme here but what we want to do is to be able to help make neuroscience accessible to coaches that they, they're our prime market but to, to anybody who's interested in learning a little bit more about human behavior and engaging perhaps differently with their clients in those transformations that they want to create with with their science with their clients so i tend to use the word brain <laughs> rather than neuro because frankly it's less scary so from that perspective those two are synonymous in in, in my mind uh, with with each other um i think it's really important that we one of the things that we we like to say that we do is debunk some of those neuroscience myths that neuro nonsense that's out there so that we can make um when we work with coaches and qualified coaches they can be confident that what we're working with them on it's it's research based it's empirical it's got a good foundation that sits behind behind it and 
mindset coaches it's interesting we were having this conversation sort of off off camera you know off recording prior you know I, I believe that any of us who are in the business of working with people in the growth arena at some level we're working with them on their mindset yes of course it's around process and um and and steps to success and there are methodologies and and all the rest of course there are but accompanying that there's also that that uh, the will to to operate with that process to create change so there'll always be an awareness and a mindset level of of what we work with so i'm not saying necessarily that neuroscience will you've got to add this in to be a great mindset coach or a great mentor in my world i feel it is additive i think what it does do is it can can uh, broaden out the conversation that you have with your clients it can create a level of curiosity with your clients curiosity is a very positive state to be in and i think that anything we can do to paint a, a broader landscape for our clients so that they can see that change is possible has to be a, a, a useful thing thank you very much and, and, and how did you get into it then because it's a, it's, it seems quite quite a niche well um, <laughs> Absolutely. And it's an increasingly popular niche, I have yes. to say. You know, and that goes in that neuro nonsense pile as well. I think it, it's fashionable. There's no doubt about it. There's, and it is popular. I'll, I'll come back to that. So I, I, um, I'm not a doctor, medical doctor, nor am I a qualified neuroscientist. I have actually done a bunch of neuroscience in business coaches taught by neuroscientists over a span of about 20 years. So to answer your question about how I got into it, most of my working life has been in the broad area of learning and development. I was one of those lucky people who landed. I went to uni. Um, I guess I was a bit scientist, uh, scientific. I did a, um, a degree in, uh, in maths and business, and I really enjoyed the psychology of of consumer behavior i really enjoyed that whole marketing element and why do people buy from certain people how do they engage with with with, with different types of brands and different types of organizations but we are talking more than 30 years ago so even the method of learning would be different how we how we learn now so was, i was always very intrigued by human relationships and i just i landed in learning and development i took a job in um, a move from manchester the manchester area down to london took a job in a big in the tech sector because my little brain was saying oh i think there's some future in technology you know i was right with that one wasn't i <laughs> you know, corporate america i joined the tech the tech setter started in marketing and very quickly ended up in employee communications and which i loved but this was before the internet before the intranet so in order to communicate with our employees we had to get out on the road and give presentations and workshops so I really early on in my career realized I loved being in that whole training piece that whole facilitation of conversation world that's where I've been ever since I've been a trainer and a coach and the brain element came in when I was running um, the leadership school for a corporate university which sounds very posh um, but it basically meant I was running leadership training in Europe and my opposite number in North America and we got on brilliantly his uncle was a neuroscientist so Dan, my colleague, started and we were talking late 90s. So, you know, the technology was very different, but he started to talk to me about bringing some neuroscience into our leadership programs. And the rest, as they say, is history. I was utterly hooked, both from a personal learning perspective. You know, I, I, it really floated in my boat in terms of my own development. But importantly, how I could in, initially in that leadership context, how I could apply that understanding of the brain, what, what, what we knew then to selling situations, marketing situations, to leadership situations, to business situations, to personal development situations. And that got me hooked. <laughs> and, and, that's a very interesting story as to that progression. And uh, so before you you got into the neuroscience and the brain elements of the learning and development what do you think was the difference in terms of your performance and what you could offer after you started taking that on board oh that's that is an interesting question so um and i think i'm probably better able to answer it when i from the perspective of when i came out of corporate life into yeah. my, my 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 own business so <laughs> so at, at its absolute core um i'm far more fired up 
when I talk about the brain. So let's be candid. We'll apply it to me instantly. So yeah. I, I, because I, I, I'm, I'm so passionate about helping people create change in their lives, um, I believe that when people um, understand that they can physically create change themselves at a physical level, they can rewire their brains. We can do, we do this all the time. So when we're working with people to change their thoughts and their actions and to grow and to reach their dreams and aspirations and visions and all the rest of it, they are through repetitive action, changing their patterns and their, and their habits. So that really fires me up to be able to know that at some sort of, physical rather than just an intellectual conversational level that we're, we're we're changing changing people you know I've always enjoyed my work so you know if I'm having a non-neuroscience based conversation then you know I, I am also fired up but for me personally um totally fired up when I'm talking ab uh, about the brain because I, I know and I teach others that what we're doing is we really are creating change at that physiological levels where we're operating at the foundations of the house to use that metaphor I used before. And anybody who can uh, get an answer for themselves as to, oh, well, this is why I am the way I am. And yes, these are my strengths. These are my preferences. So how can I now use that to for better effect? That's a really liberating, really empowering, motivating space to be in. And then when 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 we can I can work with people to help them and myself too, to help understand how I show up in the world and how they show up in the world and how what that means in somebody else's world because we're all different so how can we harness the power of two brains three brains four brains you know of what is it we can do in in teams and in whole organizations how can understanding our unique strengths and preferences how can that build help to build respect for the difference in in human beings I think I've said an awful lot there. <laughs> did no, I answer got... any question? <laughs> you, you did. <laughs> Just on the, on the periphery. <laughs> no, you definitely answered the question. And the, the, it, but also it set me up for another question because I, I, I'll bore anyone who'll listen about my woes of being a Manchester United fan and the underperformance. Oh, right. Yeah, exactly. And the underperformance of that team uh, and also the underperformance, in my opinion, of the manager. So not <laughs> specifically talking about Manchester United, but if you were, if if you saw a team that you thought actually, or you were brought in to manage, look at a team, and you thought the manager's not really getting the best out of their team, how would you use neuroscience to help so that to start to work on that team performance? Yeah, so, so that that's a brilliant question, and I will not talk about football, and you'll probably hate this. You might even press the stop record button when I tell you we're a Spurs household. <laughs> terrible, terrible. <laughs> Actually, it's not me. It's me. It's, it's the two men in my life, my husband and my son. I can't do anything <laughs> about it. <laughs> I, get, I, get really, I get relegated to a different room when Spurs are on. <laughs> oh, dear. So, so for me, and, and I mean, we learn so much, I think, from sports science, don't we? Uh, and from looking at sports teams, we tend to look at sports teams to be able to um, draw the learning from high performing sports teams into, into the business world, which, which is, it, is really interesting. For me, it is about contribution and strengths so where where we truly respect the contribution that people have got to everybody plays within that whole team context when we admit to failings when we or, or mistakes you know when we admit to mistakes when we take feedback you talked about feedback right at the beginning of, of the of, of this program here as well when we take feedback when we really are a feedback rich environment um i remember hearing years ago a presentation from a guy who now runs a a, a, a after dinner speaking or motivational speaking company he's an ex red arrow so you, you really need to be a high performing team if you are a red arrows maybe manchester united should actually employ somebody from the red arrows that, that could could Anything. be a, could, could write that down that could be a suggestion <laughs> <laughs> no, because and and the the thing about the red arrows or there are many things about the red arrows but they've got a very extensive interview procedure but evidently it's something like only half a day is it's actually about the flying you know there's an innate comp competence level that yeah, you don't even get an interview unless you've got that competence level what it is around is around how you will be a team member 
so that the egos are absolutely put on one side. It's about how you will relate well to other people, understanding what your strengths and contributions are. So what you bring to the party alongside your teammates after every flight, whether it's over Buckingham Palace on, on um, Tribune of the Colour Day or a practice flight, they always have a two hour or more debrief meeting and where they will admit, look, I think I flew like one foot too much to the left. Um, therefore, maybe we need to adjust if the wind is X, Y, Z by, by this particular distance. Because if they don't do that, then the next time somebody could die. So it really is mission, you know, really is critical. So I think to answer your, your question, what neuroscience does is it helps to give us a language for our strengths, our confidence and our contributions. So what we put into a team. And if you look at any sort of team model that talks that might, I, I tend to use a, um, like a team performance curve. So there are different things and different processes and, and uh, methodologies you can use to move up the team performance curve. What the, the methodology that we use or what, what we use in our business, we have a profiling tool that gives people a language for their strengths that's steeped in, in neuroscience for just a really small amount of work in that, that, pro, that the team process. People can move, a team can really move up the, cur the curve from um, the model that we use from what is called a potential team to a real team to a high performing team. The team process we use is we profile the whole team and then we get the team talking about difference. And so it's all about building uh, respect and understanding of the differences within the team and the different the value of those different contributions that people make because I think it's true to say that often in teams in, in business if you work in, in, in a corporate for instance we do tend to at that sort of subconscious level we tend to recruit in our own mold now there will be domains of skills so you know if you're recruiting for an accounting role then clearly you'll be recruiting people who enjoy working with numbers therefore you could say well they're probably naturally analytical and but they might not be so you might have somebody who works in an accounting team who actually gets motivated through very sensory experiences and through passion and belief and in a team situation that individual's teammates if they're all quite similar they might create some sort of like an outlier type of situation they might not feel a part of the team and it's often those small um, differences with people or that can be perceived as large differences with people that can then result in, in an outlier which I think is a very positive word potentially feeling ostracized and potentially therefore feeling rejected therefore not contributing and you start to slide down the that, that performance curve so I think a lot of it not and can't talk to Manchester United <laughs> but I think so much of this is about respect of difference and um, and really engaging with somebody, working to your own strengths, but in wanting to work with somebody else because two brains, three drink brains, five brains is potentially better than one. If, yeah, I, I, I often use the term uh, when I'm speaking to terms about the, the, the fact that I'm agnostic about the ideas and where they come from. And actually it is exactly as you've just defined there. It's about getting a group of people working to a common goal, yep. understanding that they all have differences, but actually everybody's voice is heard and understood. And actually the collection uh, and the collective leads to a better outcome than just the manager saying, I think we should do this. And everyone going, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We all agree with you then, uh, which is yeah. where the diversity is, is so critical. Absolutely. I, th I think that is so it's so important, you know, that whole area of diversity, inclusion and, you know, the, 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 but it really is at a human individual level. It 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 matters for us to feel included. And I think that, you know, a, a lot of the, the, the corporates talk the talk or, uh, around employee engagement. Well, actually, we should do more than talk the talk, you know, an engaged employee, if you're really aligned at a values level to what the organization is doing then and it's really worth organizations spending the money on making sure that they bring people on board and they retain people so that they are engaged because otherwise they'll just have a, such an attrition rate and a loss a loss rate because 
people won't feel connected. Connection is a human need because like, well, like I was describing about the potential, the feeling accountant, if you like, and I am being, you know, uh, quite obtuse in my, in my categorization there. Um, <laughs> if we feel rejected from a group, that can feel almost like physical pain. And we're mm. certainly not going to be doing our best work, are we? If we're, if we're feeling ostracized or rejected from a team. No, most certainly not. So, 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 so that's a, those are some very important points about how to go from a potential team to, to move through to high performance team. And if you've got any examples, I know my audience love the, love the examples, don't need any names, but examples of where you've, you've, you've come in and you've seen a potential team and then you've got them to, to start performing at the level you, dis, you were discussing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a, a number of them, and I, I, I'm sure I'm, I'm able to say this for, for a number of years, but we held a contract with Jaguar Land Rover and um, worked with them. They're quite hierarchical, actually, not surprising, coming out of the British motor industry. Um, and we worked with a certain level of, of managers, leaders in, in the organisation. And we did some work with different teams that came out of there who just felt that there was, um, after they'd been through the leadership programme we ran, they wanted us to come and do work with their particular team to be able to help them or sort of align, if you like, around that, you use the word common goal, but really get that whole ethos around the whole is better than the, some of the parts. And some of it is down to process. So let's be candid, you know, organizations have performance management systems, they have pay grades, they have bonuses, they have, you know, those perceived rewards, but all things being equal, if people feel that they are being paid at a, a fair level and that fairness is being able to be an exercise, it's the more human factors that really matter. So we have worked with um, a number of teams in Jaguar Land Rover, and, and I know I can say that to help them move up the performance curve. Interestingly, that organization, I loved working with them because well, it was really interesting. They were all aligned around not just the corporate goals and the financial goals, the commercial goals, but also around. I remember I worked with them when the Evoke was being designed and being, being um, initially um, put on the road. Every single person, no matter what their job was, whether they worked in procurement or I remember I worked with a lady who worked in, in um, the, the colour of the stitching on the seat. Every single person felt they had a role in putting a car on the road. Uh, isn't that fantastic you know if you if you can get you, uh, look at an organization and find teams of people universally across different functions in an organization who feel that they have had a part to play in the final you know dream that they evoke in that in that case um, being put, put on the road then that is fantastic so yeah absolutely um we, we've done a lot of work with uh, both public and the private sector um I've done a, a work, some work over the last few years with a team of doctors. At a, a, it's quite interesting because they, it was quite scary because I thought they know more about the brain than me. <laughs> and initially I went in there to do some work around, believe it or not, bedside manner. Oh uh, yeah, I, I can believe it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought, I thought, yeah, I raised my eyebrows when I, when I said that. But it was very interesting because I think when people, um, operate are as individual contributors and when we reward them as individual contributors then we sometimes forget the importance of that whole team performance curve so we did some work around um uh, performance and operating theatres where actually it really is very critical to be a a you know, a, a team. And I would say that it's at certain levels, we made a, a difference to how the whole team, the nursing staff, um, right the way through to the, the, the chief surgeon, um, how they operate together as a unit in terms of not just during the, the, the procedure, but afterwards, how they celebrated together, how they fed back together, how, you know, they operated in an emergency situation, how they operated in, in a communication situation. There's so many facets around this. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, there's, there, there's some very good examples because mm. um, I think that, that's, that, that's the key, isn't it? I think, as you just mentioned there, it's about that commonality and people feeling they're part of a, a whole, I think even individuals, lots of people say I'm an individual, I like to work on individuals, but I think it's hu the human race as yes. you said there, we lack connections. And when we can yeah. get those connections together and you feel part of something greater than yourself, you tend to work more effectively towards achieving it. Um, so, so, in, with that, yeah. so just interestingly, you, you know, you were talking about, obviously, um, you started in the set, well, the marketing arena. <laughs> uh, and I, I mean, I've obviously been in sales, etc. 
Now, interestingly, in that arena, you always have people who say, oh, well, I'm not very good at presenting or I'm nervous at presenting or I'm not very good at selling. You know, what's actually happening to the brain when people are nervous about selling or promoting themselves or promoting a service? What's happening? Okay, well, I think there are several things that are happening. The first one is that we tend to run these scripts. Yeah, at a subconscious level. So what you've just said there, Hakeem, about um, I'm not good at selling, I'm not good at marketing, I, I think it's icky to promote or whatever it is, that then we run these scripts so frequently that, that they become our truth. Whereas actually they're just stories. We all work on biases. So by, what biases do is they're shortcuts. We, we um, work, live these days in a highly stimulated world where we cannot possibly consider every single piece of information that floods into our brain and our nervous system through our, our five senses. So we pattern match in order to reach conclusions because we don't like loose ends, we pattern match. Biases, uh, which are kind of our opinions, um, tend to be some negativity associated with biases, but they're, they're very helpful because they help us to take shortcuts so we can reach conclusions. So when we're running a mantra or a script like I'm not good enough, there's this thing at a subconscious level called confirmation bias, where quite literally we seek to find something that confirms that we're rubbish at it. So we'll, we'll, for, let, let's just play this out. We'll get on the call and we'll do a sales call or we'll, we'll, we'll procrastinate most likely forever and a day, but we realize it's half past three and we better get on with it, you know, make that call we promised ourselves. And because we're not in the correct frame of mind, we're not motivated to do it. And we're kind of, you know, it's at the bottom of our list and we're telling ourselves we're rubbish. Hey, hey, hey presto, it won't go as good as potentially, or as well as potentially it could have done. So. The first part of it is around the mantras and the scripts that we we run, but we can change those. We can we can do that. And again, going back to the whole neuroscience thing, all coaches work on changing people's stories and challenging people around, you know, are they stories or are they the truth? Let's look for the evidence that they're the truth and then helping them. You and I talked about how we both enjoy reframing. You know, Mm. I think you said that to me today in in my post today, Um, trying to flip things around and ask questions around, well, what would happen if there are many ways of of helping people around that. But confirmation bias is a very 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 strong bias we seek to confirm rather than seek to deny Mm. um, because it's easier because it's a shortcut the other thing is that i and it's a very simplistic statement here that the brain is a survival machine so the brain is is is, part of its functionality or, or the reason for it is to keep us safe and this the the, 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 often we're feared or we're frightened of doing things because we're entering a world of uncertainty and we're entering a world of unknown. So hypothetically, let's say we've got a sales call happening. We don't know what the result is going to be. We don't know whether we're going to get rejected. Well, we talked a little bit about that before. Rejection, the way that, um, in the past, many, many moons ago, re- rejection from the, pro- the, the tribe that we were part of almost certainly meant death. You know, we, yeah. we were... We, we were born to survive in, in tribes. We are hardwired for connection and community in the days of the saber-toothed tiger. And if we were rejected from our tribe, then we were more likely to be subject to prey from that saber-toothed tiger. So from a neuro, uh, the brain perspective, what's going on is that that fear of selling, it's trying to keep us safe. So it keeps us in that avoidance element of, of, um, of um safety if you like so you'll have heard of the stress response most of us have and it's commonly people say well it's the fight or the flight or the freeze response as well so if we are if our brain's saying oh this is not nice this is changing this is scary i don't like the possibility of rejection then the natural response is either to fight it and say oh i don't like this there must be another way or to run away and avoid it or just to freeze on the spot and do absolutely nothing yeah that's that that is a human reaction to things so even if intellectually we know that this is the way forward our brains aren't actually helping us unless we consciously have a chat with it (laughs) and so and you know say come on you know take it by its metaphorical hand and say come on we need to change this script and all that confirmation stuff that's going on actually you're skewing it it's not real it's not true it's still part of your story and working to turn it around. 
Now that's thank you very much, and 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 that, that helps me lead me on to the it's a similar kind of question around that team performance because mm. uh, and and I've asked it, posed it and I always pose this question. So you've got a manager uh, who believes right? I've got to motivate this. I've got to motivate this individual. So the question is, can you motivate somebody, or do they need, or, or is the motivation coming from within? Okay, I think I think there's both. I think, um, you know, isn't it a shame that, you know, part of the manager's, you know, remit is motivate your staff. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I hope that that doesn't therefore mean that an employee's remit, remit is wait to be motivated by my manager. Yes. You know, the, yeah, there are different ways of looking at motivation. So intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation. So intrinsic is when it comes from, from you. And I'm really, I'll come back to that because I'm really interested in some underpinnings of how we can help ourselves to be more intrinsically motivated. Extrinsic motivation is I, what you're referring to really from the manager. So both extrinsic and, and, extri and intrinsic are about rewards you know we 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 will be motivated if there's going to be an outcome or a reward at the end of something you know and add into that there's also and again i'm sure you'll have heard of this towards and away from motivation so are we moving towards something are we moving towards joy and pleasure are we moving away from pain so it's really interesting if, if you look at somebody for instance who is trying to drop some weight are they what motivates them is it the size 10 beautiful little black dress hanging on the wardrobe or is it the side the bigger side jeans that they've got hanging on their wardrobe to remind them that they're moving away from that so mm. one isn't inherently bad however the away from is more about pain and the towards is more about joy so there is a an amount of, of, of positivity moving towards towards the joy so yeah I think that that, that managers um sh absolutely that they should um work to create a motivating environment for I think that's the really important thing for their for their staff but everybody is different I, I'll give you an example I remember <laughs> years ago when I worked when well, I worked in corporate America um, I had an American boss a, a brilliant guy he was called Kurt and he was a little tiny guy he was full of energy and he, but he was he was I worked in Uxbridge, so it wasn't America, you know, <laughs> but he had an American energy and I had an out of London, you know, working in an out of London, uh, you know, a big, big building. And he believed that, you know, it was really motivating to give people feedback in public, po positive feedback in public. And he had a budget, you know, he could give you Marks and Spencer's vouchers or a carafe of wine or whatever it was in those days. And he, we knew it would always happen on a Thursday or a Friday because he kind of, he probably had some sort of target to meet as well. So some people responded really well to Kurt bounding down the corridor, um, you know, and, and, and saying, hey, let's hear it for Jill. She's done really well this week isn't it fantastic what she's achieved with X, Y, Z? That's wonderful. Let's all, hey, let's all hear it for Jill. Some people think that's great, but it's mortifying for others. Absolutely mortifying. So one size does not fit all. In fact, that could be, that example I've given, the most demotivating experience to the extent that the people may even want to leave the organisation or certainly change, change manager. But it wasn't his intention. His intention was pure and real and very, very positive. So intrinsic motivation is where it's at. You know, that that's where, yeah, that, you know, I think you probably had a question around, around that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that question really started, came to the fore, I mean, many, many years ago. My, yeah. first, second, my first second line management job, and there was a, there was a chap, and I, I reflect on, on that job quite a lot now that I've got more, much more experience, because there was a yeah. chap in that, in that job who worked for me who had been the second line manager before done a lot of big jobs and had taken a step down so he was always trying to catch me out so I remember in the first meeting he said he said to me what are you going to do to motivate me and I'm thinking blind oh right and I and, and I and I, I thought like talked around the question but I'm thinking that's a, in, so ever since then I've been thinking well I, I, it's not my job to motivate you but but what I started to reflect on exactly what you talked about is the intrinsic and the extrinsic was understanding what the intrinsic, intrinsic motivating factors were and then create an environment, as you said, not a one size fit or, fits all that would, would bring out those intrinsic motivation factors. So you'd be motivated within 
the framework that I'd set up. And that's, that's, that, and I always, I always have this dream. I think, oh, I wish, I wish I could go back in time. You asked me that question again. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I know the answer now. But at the time, I was thinking, what do you mean? I can't, what, what am I going to do to motivate? I, I'm not sure how I can motivate you. Because if you're saying you're not motivated, I need to understand what motivates you. Because I know how to motivate that person over there, but you're not him or you're not her. Exactly. So that, Exactly. And I know, I guess it also begs the question when we're going off at a tangent here, but you know, who owns your motivation? Yes. You know, you know, who, who, it, it, do we blame all teachers if a child doesn't get the grades to go into university? You know, it's who owns that, that motivation to put the graft in and, and to, to create, create the result. Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting topic. It loops back, we talked a little bit more a bit before about engagement, employee yeah. engagement. You know, I, I think it's, it's, it's the responsibility of the manager and all managers and all people, but to create yeah. the environment whereby engagement can flourish and motivation can flourish. And I'm just, just flipping back to the intrinsic motivation. Yeah. So, because we just talked a bit a lot about, okay, what the manager can do to get that yeah, environment, yeah. et cetera. So what can we ourselves do to keep ourselves motivated? Yeah, well, well it, I, I love this topic. And, and it's um, I've, I've done a little bit of research around this. Um, and I use these these three elements with, with my clients as well when we're looking at motivation. So there is a there's a, quite a body of research. Um, and it's, it is one of my favourite theories. It's not even a theory. It's kind of like researched and proven. It's called self-determination theory so if you think about it I'm determining my my, my myself I'm, I'm determining what I do how I show up in my life and there are three elements um, of self-determination theory that really help people to um, harness their intrinsic motivation so these are and, and that you won't be surprised by any of them the first one is autonomy so it's about having freedom of choice so when you feel in control of your domain of your life of your decisions then that can be hugely motivating so from and we know from neuroscience i've kind of looked at the neuroscience that sits behind it we know from, from neuroscience and various experiments when people are wearing scary fmri caps and all the rest of it we know that when people have uh, free choice then they they have far more drive to continue working on an activity or a task and and to to also look longer term so they don't just look at what's directly in front of them they also look further out towards the horizon and keep motivated towards the future and they're also more resilient as well so number one is is autonomy and that's that's freedom of choice and I mean, we know as humans what it's like if we don't if choice is taken away i mean look at what happened with you know the, the good old c word the, and the p word covid and the the, the pandemic i think we're in different c word now because it's nearly christmas isn't it <laughs> so, <you> know, <laughs> but we, we we felt that you know choice was kind of taken away from us and so i think so many people those people that are innately self-motivated they were looking at other parts of their lives that they could grab some choice within and that's why we we saw so many people here comes another p word that new word of pivoting we saw so many people you know but positively double p you know positively pivoting on, on doing things in a different environment and it was partly subconsciously to bring some control back into their domain because that's highly motivating so when we have freedom of choice we, we we know that that's really motivated that's number one number two they call it in the, in the theory they call it mastery well that's about learning so when we feel and that's growth mindset there's a lot written about growth mindset isn't, isn't there when we feel that we are learning with a with a goal in mind most likely you know learning with a purpose um I think we're probably quite similar, Hakeem. I, I like learning about all sorts of abstract stuff as well because I make make lots of different connections and some people are like that. But when we're learning, we are broadening out rather than narrowing down. So it's not about making decisions, it's about keeping an open mind. And I think this relates a lot to a couple of areas that are well researched in neuroscience. One is curiosity. So when we're learning, we're in a curious state. And all coaches know that when their clients are in a curious state, that's sometimes when the magic happens. That's sometimes when the change, the decisions to do something different happens. Curiosity, again, it broadens us out rather than nar narrows us, us down. So it's, it's, it's a really positive uh, the place to be. And what we know from neuroscience, trying to remember the experiment, I think it's, uh, yes. So what, what, yeah. So what neuroscience tells us about curiosity um, is that, when we're curious, we don't just remember 
the activity we're working on. We remember lots of other peripheral things as well. So curiosity is really good for memory and recall, which I guess is why we're always with, with older folks, we're trying to encourage them to keep learning, to yeah. do the jigsaw puzzles and the Sudoku and chess, and learn a new game, you know, go dancing. You, you keep using your, your intellectual prowess and your, just your thinking. So we know that learning is, is super motivated and curiosity and novelty. When you learn, when you do something um, often and you create a routine, a pattern in your brain for it, that more operates on the left hand side for your brain. So just a bit of an alert here, debunking a myth. It is a myth that we have a left side that does X and a right side that does Y. We know that there are lots of parts of the brain that are highly what's called lateralized. So they do have a left and a right hemisphere, but we do use all of our brain at the same time. It's the networks that more operate more on one side than the other, not the regions per se. But when you do something almost automatically, that tends to operate a little bit more on the on the left hand side of the brain, the networks in there, which is more rules based. So more linear, the rules, the process. When you do something new, novel, you, you, you have to engage this bit of the front, the prefrontal cortex, to, because something new, you've never done it before. So you've got to think about it. That's the more modern part of the brain. And your right hand side of the brain is more around making connections and, and, and novelty. So learning number two of this um, motivational model, the self-determination model, is, um, is highly motivational and, and proven by neuroscience because it keeps us curious and engaged. And it keeps us, uh, if we're learning something new, then that uses more of the brain, which is highly energizing. So that there, there's nice sort of neuroscience that's behind that. And the third one, so we've talked about um, choice, which they call autonomy, control, uh, learning, which they call mastery. And the third one is purpose. Well, that is this is entirely my favorite topic. So you're going to have to shut me up. <laughs> <laughs> so purpose, we talked a little bit before about if um, in an organization, if people are aligned and they feel that they contribute, then that helps to to engage them. You know, as small business owners or people who work on their own, you know, I think if we all know that when we are working towards something that really is aligned to our values and our purpose it feels great mm. so even if something's hard work and more and we need to take more effort in, in that we'll still do it because we have that innate intrinsic motivation to do it because it's driving us towards something that matters to us. It's a, aligned to our purpose. And what we know from neuroscience, I think this is absolutely extraordinary, is that um, we know that people with a sense of purpose, whether it's, you know, world hunger or whether it's you know something smaller for, for your own personal goals. So it doesn't have to be something existential for the world or sustainability or, or change the planet. You know, for, for me, it's around, I, I'm niching going forward into the sobriety areas because I'm a sober lady. And for me, my purpose is around, you know, helping people change their relationship with alcohol and live a better life. And, and I'm, I'm gonna do that through helping them understand the power of their brain to get them on that on that journey but when we're aligned with our purpose we are super motivated and what we know from neuroscience is that it makes us biologically more resilient so what that means is we can bounce back from setbacks more easily so and it kind of if we all if you think about this just away from the neuroscience um and, and experiments kind of makes sense doesn't it that if you've got a good purpose and okay yeah, that didn't work. I'll try again another day. So it kind of makes sense. We also know that um, purpose releases, um, I think they call it the, oh, I think it's the, the happiness trifecta. Why they can't use the word trio, I don't know, <laughs> but of neurotransmitters. So it, it, it produces the rewarding motivational neurotransmitter dopamine, um, serotonin, which is about mood um, enhancements, um, and oxytocin, which at its basis is about connection and love. So it's, it's about connecting with yourself and also connecting with your purpose and really loving your purpose and, and loving what you're doing in life. So, um, so that's quite a, a long answer to the question about intrinsic motivation. So it's autonomy, mastery, and purpose. So choice, learning, and purpose are the underpinnings of intrinsic motivation. Wow. Well, <laughs> even if you take not one other thing out of it, 
Oh, and I know everybody will take loads out of it. That alone has been worth the price of admission, although admission's free. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, it, but it has, it, it, it really, I, I like the way you put that together and that purpose. If so, is that purpose similar to uh, what Simon Sinek talks about in terms of his why? Yeah. I love him. Yeah. And I, and I, I think he, he deserves to have had all those millions of hits on his TED Talks. I just I, I think I must have cut, you know, contributed a million of them because I keep on rewatching re it. Yeah, absolutely. So he, he um, is all about identifying your why. You know what? And, you know, we, we can make it really big. Why? Why am I here in the world? You know, why do I exist? You know, in that existential sense. But, you know, wh why do I get out of bed every day is, you know, and, and why do I switch on my computer as part of my morning routine? You know, th these are really, really good questions to ask. And, you know, if, if we I think, you know, the whole why, who, how, where, when yeah. um all all of those those questions you know we can answer the how how we're going to go to market you know when we're going to make that sales call who we're going to involve in our team or be our mentor you know all, all of the all of the, which program we're going to buy but unless we know why we're just following a series of actions and and, and i think that that you know and it goes back to what i said at the beginning of of here about using neuroscience and Neuroscience helps people understand why they are the way they are, why they are unique because of their unique brains and what's going on, you know, on, on in their heads. I think Simon Sinek's work is, is, is superb. It's again, it's really accessible yeah. um, and it makes sense of quite a big question, you know, because it is, you know, why am I here in the world? Or, you know, what, what is my purpose is a big question for people to answer and actually, not surprisingly there's a spiral around it if you don't have a purpose and you're feeling pretty demotivated it's a even bigger question to answer isn't it it becomes more challenging to answer if you're motivated and feeling optimistic and buzzed up then answering those types of questions um are, are more are interesting to you because you're innately curious and you're enjoying the, the novelty of it and and therefore you're you're broadening out your scope of of, of how you might answer yeah, no, and, and, and I think that the, the two things that pop to my mind whenever I, I think about the why, the first one is from a a, um, a business point of view in, in terms of what I'm managing and who you're managing. If you can get, and you hope there is a why, of the business, it's yeah. a lot easier to then determine the sort of people you want to recruit and get them motivated around that why. Uh, and then the other one is basically, because obviously I'm in the sales and marketing game, if I can understand my customers' why, then it's a lot better and it, well it's not just a lot better it's a lot easier to actually make sure that you get to understand what products and services you have can help them deliver their why because if you can help someone deliver their why that's much more effective than helping them, them to deliver their what or their how uh, and that's what people focus on I love that. I think there's so much you want. I mean, it is recorded, obviously. I know I'll, I'll <laughs> capture that one. When I listen back at this, I will I will capture that because it is, I agree with you, it's far better than helping them deliver their what and their house. The what and the how, yeah, it's going to give them something. And but if you can layer that with the why, and if, if your messaging can talk to their why, which is what we're all trying to do, you know, we're, yeah. we're looking to create, help people create transformations by uh, taking our valuable services you know let's not force fit a square peg into a round hole you know if, if it doesn't fit their why then that's okay if somebody else is their supplier <laughs> you know in that regard ab absolutely I'm, I'm with you 100 percent around that that whole area of recruiting for fit um or, or alignment values alignment wouldn't it be wonderful if we if we interviewed people around their values and 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 that why you know as a layer upon skills of course we've got to have the innate skills to be able to do the job um you know i mean if somebody gave me an interview to be an actuary well you know a i wouldn't get the interview but b i'm not sure well it'd be very interesting <laughs> but it wouldn't be a match of skills but if it was an actuarial organization that operated uh, in an arena that was helping people to quit the booze then i might be tempted to go and talk to them mm. Not necessarily about that job, but you know, it's it's interesting. We we can we can, and, and I think that's also a point as well that our purpose can align to an organisation if 
they are, uh, you know, depending on what the organization's why is. Yeah. So I'm coaching somebody at the moment who works for a charity um, and she, she I, I won't name it because, you know, of confidentiality, but she works for a charity. She's so aligned to what the charity does and yet she's not aligned to what her job does within that. She knows mm-hmm. she can do it. She's bright, she's smart, she puts in a huge amount of effort, but she's not enjoying her day job. So, you know, I, I think it really matters that she finds somewhere that she can, can, can she, she's, she's happy in inverted commas in so much that she's aligned to the output of the, organize, the, the charity in the organization, but what she's doing every day isn't really playing to her, her, her personal why. Okay, thank Her you skill very set. much. Yeah. Thank you very much. So, so obviously everybody who's watching this will have a growth mindset, otherwise they're watching it. <laughs> but, I'm, but I'm sure there might be either someone watching it or somebody who's watching it who knows somebody who haven't got a growth mindset and they're sitting there thinking, oh, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. This is all <laughs> going good. Jill's talking about this growth mindset, this, <laughs> you know, the uh, self-determination theory. I'm too old. I can't change it. Is that true? Is, is that a thing? I you've now got to a situation, and you can't you can't change habits. Well, well, you can change habits absolutely, and it's but it is really interesting that statement or that phrase. You can't teach a dog old tricks. Don't we find that older folk in our lives tend to become more set in their ways? Yeah, we definitely. Do. Uh, yeah, and and that's because the the routines and the patterns and the habits that they have laid down they've been done more often so mm. you know they've been laid down more frequently so those neural pathways for all those routines and patterns have been laid down and also maybe the why in their lives is different so the what why do i need to change they haven't necessarily answered that question you know that again going back to the, the, the brain is a is a um, survival machine change can be scary for for people and yeah if we do get set in our ways then the motivation to change your habits might be lower but you can teach an old dog new tricks both literally my poor old charlie my 11 year old labrador has got terrible osteoarthritis we've drugged him and he's still running for the ball <laughs> so we can, but i'm not suggesting that i'm not necessarily advocating that so if you if you look if you look at habits Habits, and I, and I love the topic of habits. It's really interesting. I think one of my favorite books, it's not a neuroscience book, but it's a Atomic Habits by, um, is it Charles? Um, I can't remember the name, Atomic, oh, James Clear. James Clear, it's a fabulous book. Um, and, and if you look at habits, habits consist of a loop. There will always be some form of trigger, whether you're aware of it or not, it may be subconscious. Then there's the behavior. So what you do in your habit, yeah, well, we're trying to teach you a new trick, yeah, but your old trick, the behavior will be in the middle. And then there's the reward you get for carrying out that habit, for carrying out that old trick. So sometimes it's worth looking at the whole line of that so what's the trigger what triggers me into eating a bar of chocolate at four o'clock in the afternoon what reward am I getting over and above the fact that I like the taste of chocolate you know what else is it giving me is it giving me permission to put on the afternoon television because that's what I'm enjoying and what's the trigger is it is the trigger just looking at the clock is it the light going outside is it the fact that I'm hungry and I've got a, a, a sugar and loss you know or, or deficit at that time of day you know, what is it so if you're able to look to to look at all three of those the trigger the behavior and the award the reward it's easier potentially to change it if you want to and that's that's a, a, a really big rider on this often when we're looking at changing the habit so let's say we wanted to give up smoking we change we look at the behavior you know so what i'm all we're, we're on a diet or something or i want to drink more glasses of water a day so let's say i wanted to drink more smoking might be a bit challenging so let's say i wanted to look at drinking more water a day so I'd, it's easy that's the behavior i would drink more water i'd line up eight glasses or have two two liter bottles of whatever it is that's my behavior what can I do to trigger myself into drinking the more the water and what can I do what what am I going to do to reward myself so it becomes ingrained as a habit so maybe the trigger is an alarm you know maybe you set an alarm every hour or maybe you 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 put uh, you give yourself 50 minutes at work and then you give yourself a 10 minute break and as part of that break you'll drink your water what new trigger can you put in place 
And sometimes with triggers, it's really good to, and, and James uh, Clear talks about this in his book, to piggyback on something else. So if there's something else you do, then add your new habit to it. So if there's something else you do that's good. So let's say you, you take a break every 50 minutes or you, you, know, or you turn your email off every 50 minutes. Um, and that's a good thing to do. You get up and move. Maybe that's the time that you piggyback on your new behavior, drinking the water. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, it makes perfect sense. And so what reward, additional reward, other than the fact that all the books say, aren't you a good girl for drinking more water? What reward are you going to give to yourself? So rewards are quite interesting. We tend to, um, in, in the common parlance of the English language, think the rewards are things like, um, oh, I'll reward myself with a glass of wine or a, or a new Mulberry handbag or, a, you know, a, a new pair of shoes or I'll go shopping or I'll, a new movie, whatever it might be. In your brain the rewards can actually be as simple as keeping you safe or keeping you in your familiar patterns. So when you're changing a habit, it's really useful to be overt about the rewards. And those rewards can be as simple as writing well done, <laughs> you know, on a post-it note. And then at the end of the week, if you've got, you know, X number of well dones, then maybe you buy yourself your mobile handbag or whatever. You know, it doesn't have to be a, a, a physical um, object as a, a materialistic reward. It can just be feeling blooming good about yourself, you know, fantastic. And maybe your reward at the end of the week is, right, OK, I've done all my water. I'm going to close down my laptop at four o'clock on a Friday. And that then becomes a, a new habit. But it's a reward for you as well. So you can teach an old dog new tricks, but the dog needs to want to be taught some new tricks as well. They need to have a degree of willingness. Um, and if, if, if you don't have the degree of willingness, then what's happening is that your lack of willingness is taking up all of those chunks of, of brain power and you'll be used back to the mantra. You'll be thinking, oh, for goodness sake, Hakeem is trying to make me drink water now. What a waste of time. And that will be taking up the space in your brain and you'll be looking to confirm again that water's a rubbish thing to do and you won't be thinking about your reward and your triggers. Okay, thank you. So, so linking that one, uh, because obviously there's lots of talk about, um, you know, does the brain change? And you mentioned it earlier in terms of um, helping people, you know, memory games, people yeah. talking about old people. Is that what, when people are talking about neuroplasticity, is that, is that the sort of thing they're talking about? Is, how, how, does that, how does that come about? You know, what, what's the relevance in business? Oh, absolutely. So uh, neuroplasticity is one of my favourite words. Um, and I believe that anybody who does change work, we are in the business of neuroplasticity. So at its simplest, it's it's really the brain is plastic I mean, it's not really plastic but the brain is malleable you know it, it the, the networks change and move all the time depending on where the chemicals and the electricity in inverted commas are firing depending on what you're actually doing so when you create a new pattern when you do something differently and you do it repeatedly you will start to lay down new pathways for that, that particular action. And therefore you're changing your brain. So you are, you are pulling the plastic metaphorically of your brain into a different metaphorical shape. I also, I like to liken it to um, say a sunflower field. You know, you know imagine a, a wonderful a sunflower field, you know, full of those really, I mean, have you seen the sunflowers? They've got really yeah. strong stalks. You know, if you ever buy a bunch of sunflowers, they, they are really strong and they get, they they're able to get really, really tall. If you see a, a sunflower field, it's amazing. But if you were to walk through a sunflower field, the first time you did it, it would take a lot of energy and you'd probably have to bash away some of those stalks. And then the next time there'd be a bit of a path there for you to go through. And when you go through it about a hundred times, there'll be a really nice wide path available to you to walk through that sunflower seed field. So it's a bit like the brain and, and neuroplasticity in that regard, that you are creating new pathways that effectively are wider and stronger and therefore more accessible. They attract more neurons to it, so they become busier. And because you're doing something repeatedly time and time again, that's neuroplasticity. It's about creating change in your brain by doing things different. And I think that's one of the most powerful uh, messages about neuroscience and coaching or anything in that growth and change and development sphere 
that we can, through our change work, through our transformation work, we can change people's brains. People can change their own brains. That's the most empowering message, that we, we can change our scripts, our thoughts, our actions, and then at a physical level, our brains are changing too. And I think that's a really empowering, liberating thing to take, message to take. And, and bearing in mind, obviously, that change of the brain, uh, like if you're building muscle uh, yeah. at a gym, uh, obviously helps the health of the person. Yeah. Uh, would you suggest, if even if you're, because lots of people are, will be looking at this and thinking, well, how do I get to the top of my game? Or oh, I'm at the top yeah. of the game, so I don't need to do anything else. Would you suggest, <laughs> even if you're at the top of your game, you should still be looking at those neural pathways and seeing how you can improve? And you talked about curiosity, you know, and that curiosity is building those new neural networks all yeah. the time, isn't it? It's interesting because I wonder if there's anybody who's really at the top of their game who <laughs> isn't off the growth mindset. You know what I mean? Yeah. That, that they would naturally do that in a way that they have that innate intrinsic motivation, that fire in their belly, that they want to carry, they're curious, that they want to try new things in a way. Um, you know, I, I think we are, lose it or you, uh, use it or lose it is a, is a truism. Um, and this is why when we do work with elderly people, you know, and, 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 and we look at sort of Alzheimer's and dementia and staving off those, Mm. there isn't a magic pill but we do know that cognitive um uh using your your your, your brain um doesn't necessarily stave it off but it helps you know keep keeping your brain busy active and curious um, helps in in those regards so you know even people who are real high performers and at the top of their brain absolutely keep learning yeah. and apart from anything else you might find a new revenue channel <laughs> but you know keep learning because learning is really healthy for your brain you know when when i talk about feeding your brain i actually did a presentation this week for a, the food sector of the, the, the estonian um, uh, chamber of commerce um and they were interested in you know the, the physical food that we eat to 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 keep our brain healthy um and lifestyle choices as well you know part of those lifestyle choices yes of course it's about exercise and water but it's also about keeping your thinking fresh mm -hmm. and and uh, you know and, and and filling your your brain funnel if you like with with novelty and curiosity and ideas that keeps us active it keeps us interested and and i think that that keeps us on top of our game hakeem no, I, I, I would certainly agree. And, and, and an old boss of mine very early in my career talk, talks about a thirst for knowledge. Yes. Uh, and, yeah. I, and I always uh, obviously try to learn myself, but I'm always encouraging um, people who work with me or for me to actually, you should be looking for things that you're interested in. Because a lot, a lot of the ideas I come out of or, or come out with or think about are not taken from me looking at something specifically about my business it's always yeah. I'm reading about something or I see something yes. on the tv or hear something and I'm reading uh, and I think that's really important which is a nice little segue to uh, yeah. your book that I can see <laughs> slip just behind you on your oh, yes. uh, beautifully on your curated <laughs> that's fantastic so, so tell me about it but what you know why did you re read it what did it teach you what did it teach others Oh my goodness, so so much there. So so I, I, I'm one of these people who's always said, oh, I have a book in me, you know. I mean, <laughs> how, I, I don't know what the percentage of a pop the population is. So it was, um, I, I, and it is actually tied up with my personal story. When I when I when I quit the booze, which was that that's an, another story. Um, and I made a decision about uh, four four and a half years ago to do so. Um, I, I, I was then in the, in the right state of mind to do these things I'd always promised myself. You know, it wasn't a target. It was just, it, it kind of felt right. Plus, I'd reached the stage in my career where I felt that I'd earned the right, if you like. You know, I gave myself permission to be able to share uh, some of my some of my stories. And I think maybe you need to you need to get to that point. The irony of all of this is that I think I was holding myself back the way that you know many of my clients hold themselves back as well. You know, we don't necessarily practice what we preach. So <laughs> I wa I wanted to uh, to to offer a book that that was again in that middle ground of, of taking that weighty academia making it accessible but not making it neuro nonsense to debunk some myths give a little bit about the, the physical brain but tell it tell it through real life stories so there are six chapters in there uh, well there are more chapters but there are six stories in there about real clients whose names have been changed to protect the, the innocent <laughs> they all they all gave me permission to use their stories just to show 
show other coaches how offering that layer of neuroscientific conversation within um, the, these different coaching engagements, and they all came with different presenting issues, different ways they wanted to be helped, different ways to change. So the purpose was to show coaches how adding that layer in might be helpful and to sort of share the benefits uh, around, around that. And boy, I learned so much about myself through that process because I would say that um, naturally I am um, all about people and I'm all about ideas. I oper operate more in that sort of my preferences, if you like, are more around um, connecting with people and connecting with ideas rather than analysis of information and research and operating in a linear way. So I had to, you know, develop a plan. <laughs> otherwise, you know, otherwise I, you know, it would never have got done. But I also come from the perspective that planning frees me up to be spontaneous. So, I, you know, I've kind of found the, the way to, you know, I really respect planning and process. So and I had to have a planning and process in order to be able to to um, to get the book finished, um, but stay creative, you know, creative and full of ideas. So it took me a year. Um, and it was very important to me that it uh, it was steeped in uh, research. So I have um, that there are multiple references at the end of it. And I've referred to many research studies um, at the amazing um, global institutions and universities around around the world, but hopefully made them relevant um to to the world of coaching by telling stories i know that stories engage with people and i think i, I, I might have brought it nearer to some people by by um sharing real life coaching situations that sounds uh, like a, that sounds exactly what you need to do because i think that lots of people have theories about coaching and put theories into print but yeah. I think as human beings, we connect to stories and there's a whole raft of people Absolutely. who do, do about storytelling. So, so when you yeah. write a book, I think to actually put real life stories helps yes. to connect with people. OK, so we've got we, we've come to the end. No! Uh, but I know it's, it's past, our, but we, <laughs> as I said, we'll definitely go over the hour. Um, but so what, right. what, what would you say is the best tip? that you could offer to a person in business from a neuroscience perspective. So from all the things that you've we've talked about uh, in this past hour and a bit, if you want to leave the audience with one thing that they can take away and use in their business, what would it be? Okay. So I don't know if it's going to blow your mind because it's really, really, really simple. But the one tip is be you. You know, because my mum used to say, and I've subsequently discovered that evidently Einstein said it too. She used to say, <laughs> be you, Jill, because everyone else is taken. You are absolutely unique. Everyone is. Our brains may physically look the same and be way around about three pounds. But inside of your brain is your unique network with your DNA, your genes, your experience, your stories, your mantras and your growth mindset. So your clients will buy you so be you you know don't be anybody else you know the world is full of cookie cutter approaches be you and you know and, and, and i'm going to add an and naughty naughty you know trust your gut instinct as well trust your gut i think uh, yeah the be you is i've always been me actually so <laughs> to, <laughs> Good. To, to, to either my to either my benefit or my detriment but I, i've always thought that if if people don't like me then at least I'm being myself. And if people like me, I'm being myself. Because the, the, the last thing you want is that people, say, for whatever reason, take a dislike to you. And it's because you're being somebody else. And you think, oh, if I only, if only I'd be myself, they'd probably like that person or not. But, it, but at least you can, I've always taken a view, if I can go home and look at myself in a mirror and say, well, I've done everything that I can do, then there's nothing else that anybody can ask for me. And I, and I say that to everybody all the time. So just, just do what you can do. You can't absolutely. be trying to be somebody else. And I, I really like that phrase, be you, because everyone else is taken. Yeah, so absolutely. Gonna... You're perfect just the way you are. You know, exactly. ab ab absolutely. Today, you're perfect just the way you are. You can choose to do something different tomorrow, but be you and be authentic. Yeah. Really like that. And it's perfect. So place to, to finish. So if people want to get hold of you because i know people watch it and oh that's pretty brilliant i need to get hold of jill and, so. and help me with my coaching where 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 should they go 
The, the best place actually is is LinkedIn for, for okay. myself. I post every day about the brain, something about the brain. Um, well, I have Saturday and Sunday off, sorry. So it's five <laughs> days a week. So the best way for me is LinkedIn. We're, we're actually upgrading our website at the moment. So I won't guide you towards there at the moment. Um, and also Instagram. But LinkedIn is where I, I hang out on social Okay, that's terribly I will, modern. <laughs> I will, of course, you are, and that's obviously where we met. So we're both terribly absolutely. Modern. No, uh, so yeah, yeah. I, I will uh, put those links in below the podcast. Lovely. And um, I would like to say thank you very much, Jill, for joining me today. It's been an absolute pleasure, and I know that my audience will love it. And I'll look forward to giving you their feedback. Fantastic, and hopefully one of them will win one of those mugs as well. Oh, thank you, course, thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> it's it's been a joy to talk to you, Hakeem. We could have gone on for a long time, um, but we knew we'd beat the hour, didn't we? You know, we'd go over. Guaranteed. <laughs> thank you. Thank been you a pleasure. Much.